Hi there. Welcome back. It's good to have you with us today as we're uh, here for our second uh, in this series on the Psalms, the Songs of God's People. And last week, or last time we were here, we learned that the Psalms were collected over many years. And it's a collection of poems and praises. So here's the thing. For all these years, ever since they were collected, the Psalms have been considered the songbook of God's people. We also learned that there are many styles of Psalms. And the Hebrew poetry focuses more on a line of thinking than on a line of rhyme, although it could uh, in the original. And last week we looked at Psalm 90, which was the oldest psalm in our Bible and uh, written by Moses. And Moses taught us several things, uh, that we are travelers and God is our home, that we are learners and life is our school and life is brief and it passes quickly. And sometimes life is difficult and it seems futile for us believers. But for us believers, the future is our friend. I'm going to pray and then we'll dive into Psalm 91. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and this opportunity to be here. I pray that this message will be one of encouragement to everyone who tunes in. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week's uh, message and psalm that we looked at focused on the difficulties of life. And the emphasis today in this passage is on the dangers of life. Yeah, and as we go through this, I want you to watch out for hidden traps and deadly plagues and arrows by day and terrors by night and more. So listen to how, and listen how tender and intimate the psalmist describes uh, the confidence that we have in God. Last week, Moses told us that we are travelers and God is our home. Look how this psalm echoes that thought. This brings us to our, our key verse today. It says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of God of the Almighty. And uh, verse 2, I will say to the Lord, uh, uh, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. That's Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler um, and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. So verses 1 through 4, uh, which I just read, constitute our first section of the poem. And if you're into taking notes, you can write this down as Roman numeral number one, that for believers, the life is hidden in God. We live a life hidden in God. And if you hang around me very long, you'll often hear me say that the things we can't see are often so much more important than the things we can. And the most important part of a believer's life is the part that only God can see, and that's the hidden life. You say, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> you and I, as believers, have a hidden life of worship and communion with our God. Um, and so, in, in the Old Testament, that was symbolized by the Holy of Holies, that, that super sacred place the, the high priest would only go into one time a year. And uh, the book of Hebrews tells us that because of the blood of Jesus, we have uh, the boldness to enter into the most holy place. Now, the writer of this psalm has two addresses for us. Uh, the first one is in verse 1. He says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide. You, you, where you abide, your, your abode, uh, is in the shadow of the Almighty. And we'll come to the second dwelling place in a little bit. It's his tent when we get down to verse 9. But see, here's the thing. It's so important. And we really all need to get this. 
that the safest place in the world is a shadow. <clears throat> That's from Warren Wiersbe. I love that thought. The safest place in the world is a shadow. In fact, write that down as capital A. The shadow of God Almighty is the safest place to dwell. See, Jesus pictured salvation, uh, gave a picture to salvation by describing how chicks would hide under the wings of a mother hen. Both Matthew and, and Luke record that for us. He said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that kills the prophets and stones them that are sent to her. How often I would have loved to have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chicks, <laughs> even as a hen gathers her chicks um, <clears throat> under her wings, and you would not have it. The closest picture we have to God's dwelling place is the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament. It was in the, and there was the most holy place in the tabernacle and later in the temple. And the psalmist pictures that our communion with God, as if we are resting under the wings of the cherubim in the temple. Remember on the Ark of the Covenant, it had the two cherubim on it. I should have got a picture of it uh, to show you here. I'm sorry. Anyway, the psalm writer also uses differing names of God in these verses to encourage us to trust him, okay? In verse 1, he's referred to as the Most High, Elion in the, uh, in the Hebrew, uh, the Most High. And you get a hint of this as God's name in most, most translations in English because they capitalize uh, the word in the Bible because it's a proper noun. It's a name of God, a name for God. And the word, uh, as I said, was Elion. The psalm writer uses this title for God in both verses 1 and verses 9. So where he's referring to our dwelling place, our tent and our, and our shadow, or his shadow. Okay, the first time we encountered this uh, name for God was in Genesis chapter 14, where he's talking about the king of Salem, uh, Melchizedek, yeah, which Jesus was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. I just find this fascinating, uh, the way this all ties together. And God is, our God is the most high God. He's higher than all the kings of the earth and all the false gods around the world. And he's also the almighty. Yeah, Shaddai. He's uh, Shaddai, the God who is adequate for every situation and the one who possesses all might. I don't know what your situation is today, but if you need help, you, then you need Shaddai. Just pray to God and say, Lord, you are the one who's adequate for every situation and just commune with him and worship him for who he is, the one who possesses all might. Verse 2 refers to him as Lord uh, Jehovah. Yeah. Uh, it's the translated from the word Lord is translated from the word Jehovah. He's the covenant making God who's faithful to keep his promises. Yeah. And, and in, uh, in verse 2, he is God, Elohim. Yeah, there. The powerful God whose greatness and glory exceeds all all we can think or imagine. Isn't that amazing how he just weaves all these different titles in for uh, God's names, which are really his attributes, right? This is the God who invites us to have fellowship with him. He invites us into it. It's the hidden life of worship and communion that makes possible the visible life of service and obedience. We're, we can't even serve God how we, the way we should if we don't have the hidden life of worship and obedience. He shelters us under the wings of the cherubim, but he also gives us spiritual armor. Uh, jump over with me to Ephesians chapter 6. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the people in the pew next to us or the guy or gal at work. It's against what? The devil's schemes. <clears throat> our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, against the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's who our struggle is with. We are on God's side of this cosmic battle between good and evil. Uh, if you listen to my messages uh, online at, at southhillbaptist.org, then you, you know that I believe that this struggle be, was going on in the heavenlies before God said, let there be light. Anyway, because there's this struggle going on, Paul writes, therefore, put on, put on the full armor of God. So the, when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Don't you want to be able to do that? And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to this, take up the shield of faith, which with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. It's like this whole, whole full body shield that you can just duck behind. When the arrows come in, just tuck in behind the shield, full body shield, and pooh! They won't get you. Okay, where was I? And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. There's your offensive weapon. Okay? Don't make your tongue your offensive weapon. Make this the offensive weapon. Right? Friends, God gives us the spiritual armor we need, and His truth and His faithfulness protect us as we claim His promise and live lives of obedience. The psalmist is clear that those who abide in, are, in the Lord are safe when they are doing his will. God's servants are immortal until their work is done. Don't you, aren't you glad? Aren't you, aren't you thankful that when, you know, pandemics are, and plagues and famines and droughts he protects and preserves his people, and every one of us has protection. In fact, write this down as Roman numeral number two. We are, the psalmist is talking about the life protected by God. And this next paragraph emphasizes that we don't need to be afraid because the Lord and his angels watch over us. Listen to the way the psalmist puts it. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. Come on, turn, turn, thank you. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand on your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Wow. For he will command his angels concerning you on and to guard you in all your ways and on, on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a, a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, and the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Now, we could spend hours unpacking this passage. Uh, it's just so amazing, and there's so much to it. I, but I love this picture of divine protection. Don't you? Um, and this section highlights our key thought for today. Now, because there, so let me just hit you with it and then we'll talk more about it. Believers cannot avoid 
confronting unknown perils. You and I, we can't. We can't avoid it, but we can escape the evil consequences. In the ancient Near East, travel was difficult and it was dangerous if you didn't have armed guards. You know what? And it's not that different from some sections of large cities today. That, that The phrase terror by night could simply mean fear of the dark or being afraid of what can happen in the darkness. And when the psalmist wrote this, you know, clean water wasn't even something you took for granted, uh, like coming out of every tap you found. In America, we're so fortunate that almost, well, virtually every tap that you can turn on has potable water in it, no matter if it's on the side of a building or the side of someone's house or the front of their garage, wherever it is, that tap has potable water. Blows the mind uh, the, of the people in other parts of the world. When I was in Peru uh, with Jungle Master Ministries, the people in the village could not believe uh, that, that we flushed our toilets with water that was safe to drink. They just thought that was wrong. And of course, they live in a country where fresh water is something you don't take for granted. Um, so, in the absence of what we call healthy living, it made it easy in, in the ancient Near East to contract a disease. And this, this phrase, uh, destruction that lays waste at noon in verse 6, probably refers to the hot desert sun. Yeah. If we've had a kind of a heat wave going and, and boy, some plants just waste away there here in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of our trees uh, are dying and because they just didn't get enough rainwater and, and people die, of course, with that water. And the entire nation of Israel witnessed with their own eyes uh, the grief that the Egyptians had when the angel of death uh, came through Egypt. In verse uh, 7, it, it describes, it reads like a description of a battle, and that may be referring to the covenant promises that God made Israel back in Leviticus. And as I said, they witnessed the, what happened and the grief when the angel of death came through Egypt, and they were spared on that first Passover when they sprinkled the blood on the doorpost of their home. Talk about foreshadowing of what the blood of Jesus was going to do for you and I. Remarkable. No harm came to God's people, and, and an angel went before them to prepare and to lead the way. In Exodus 32, verse 20, God said to uh, the, is Moses and Israel, Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you by the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. If you've read through your Bible very much, you know that this is one of the passages that the devil uh, quoted in the New Testament when the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted and, and to, to, be, to be tempted by the devil. Satan quoted part of verses 11 and 12, and Jesus responded by quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, you shall not tempt Jehovah your God. And of course, had the Father in heaven commanded Jesus to jump from the pinnacle of the temple, the angels no doubt would have cared for him. But to jump without the Father's command would not have been faith, but presumption. And that would have been tempting the Father. All through scripture, we see the lion and the serpent or the cobra as images of Satan, and there is no doubt that in the day the psalmist wrote this, that these were very dangerous enemies, particularly for someone walking on a narrow path, maybe up in the mountains or something. So we have our, our hidden life, our life hidden in God, verses 1 through 4, and we have our life protected by God. Uh, and in this last section, uh, verses 5 to 13, brings us to the life of satisfaction. Write this down as Roman numeral number three. Uh, 14 through 16 brings us to uh, the life of satisfaction. So let's check it out here. Verses 14 through 16. Um, Be, because he holds me fast, 
because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. This is God talking. Because he, you and I, he or she holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. Isn't that a remarkable? And when he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him to show him my salvation. Again, this is God speaking and announcing what he's going to do for those of his people who truly love him and acknowledge him and live lives of obedience. It's interesting here because this word translated love is not the usual one, uh, but one that means to cling to or to cleave to, to be passionate. Um, it's also used in Deuteronomy 7, 7 and uh, Deuteronomy 10, 15 to describe the love Jehovah has for his people. Remember, Jehovah is the covenant-keeping God, the promise-keeping God. See, here's the thing. The satisfied life is lived out in love for God. Among the blessings that those who love God receive are deliverance and protection, answered prayer, um, companionship in time of trouble, honor, satisfaction, and salvation. And so, as we conclude today and we think about these things, we've looked at, at hidden traps, the deadly plagues, the terrors at night. And, you know, this is not saying that if you're a Christian, you don't have to, you know, that you're not going to get catch a plague and die. No, God's, you know, brought plagues against his own people. Uh, and quite frankly, the way the church in America is acting and has become so self-centered instead of God-centered, I'm, I'm quite I'm really not surprised that we have a deadly plague going around the world. And, and church, we really probably should wake up. Um, but we, because we can't avoid confronting, you know, unknown perils, but we can escape evil. I'm looking over at my, at my outline board. But we can escape the evil consequences. So deadly plagues, terrorist attacks. You know, we, we face these things, the arrows that fly by day for the psalmist aren't that different from, you know, deadly plagues, terrorist attacks, reckless drivers, snipers. Man, remember this one guy was sniping people from shooting from through a hole in the back of a trunk of a car a few years back. I mean, we've had cougar attacks and bear attacks. So, you know, in fact, our world today in uh, modern times may even be more dangerous than that that the psalmist faced. But even though we can't avoid what we don't know is coming, we can escape the evil consequences um, the Apostle Paul, King David, Moses, and a host of servants of God faced great danger in accomplishing God's will. And we know for a fact that the Lord saw them through. Um, but a thorough reading of Scripture also reminds us that other believers were tortured, martyred, beheaded, crucified, Yet their faith was just as real as the Apostle Paul or King David or Moses. So we don't want to read into this what God's not saying. And it's especially important not to take a small section of Scripture and to write a, a doctrine uh, or a theo theological stance on it. Now, it's, it's, it is part of, it's all inspired, it's all part of God's Word, but, you know, some churches will take this, you know, and say, oh, you can trample serpents, so let's walk barefoot in a snake pit on our church service. No, that's not what this is saying we should do. Um, we do so we don't have a guarantee that we won't face dangerous things in life. You know, the plague may actually come into our tent. But we do know, without a doubt, that walking with the Lord generally helps us detect 
and avoid a great deal of trouble, and that even if we must suffer, it is better to suffer in the will of God than to invite trouble by disobeying God's will. The salvation mentioned here at the end of the psalm could be taken to mean help and deliverance during life, like we would see in, say, Psalm 50, verse 23. But I think it refers to the joy of beholding God in all his glory at the end of a satisfied life, however he chooses to take you home. So, Christian, it might be a heart attack, it might be a stroke, it might be cancer, it might be a terrorist attack, it might be COVID-22. <laughs> we just don't know. It, yeah, to the Jewish, to the Jewish mindset, the living a long life and seeing one's children and grandchildren, or perhaps great grandchildren, was considered the ultimate blessing in life. They wanted the Jew wanted to live. Uh, they wanted to be like Abraham and and die of an a good old age, full of years. It just means to live a fulfilled life. You know, it's one thing for a doctor or the doctors to add years to your life. But it's God who adds life to our years and makes this life worth living. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do indeed bring salvation to your people. You bring deliverance. And so help us to learn to live the life of faith knowing that we can't avoid unknown perils. We can't. We don't see the future and what's coming at us. All of us have got something coming our way. Uh, but Lord, we can escape the evil consequences. And so I pray for everyone listening to this message, that you would help them to be encouraged in their faith and their walk with the Lord Jesus. I pray these things in his great name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining in today. Uh, whether it's nighttime where you're at or morning, doesn't matter. I'm just glad you joined in. Thank you for uh, uh, sharing this with other friends who maybe need a bit of encouragement. Uh, we're going to continue on for a while in the Psalms. Um, I'm working on another series that's going to start uh, take us through the book of Mark. So you can be praying for me as uh, we are going to do a whole book study on the Gospel of Mark. Uh, when we finish up some of these, this little detour in the book of Psalms. So until next time, God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And everybody said, amen. Okay, until next time. Thanks very much for joining in. And uh, we'll see you back here soon. Lord willing. All right. Bye-bye.